you're watching The Last Word, I'm Sanjana. The yearly figure of student suicide rates in 2018 turned out to be the highest in a decade. Over 10,000 in 2018. That's 10,000 young people's lives lost. Worse, they kill themselves. The thought is heartbreaking. What's even worse is that there has been a spike and it seems like we are almost unwilling to address the issue or perhaps we're just not aware about them. One in seven Indians is also affected by a mental disorder. And maybe one of those is a child or a student or a young person who thought of ending their life. So can we now continue to be in denial about mental health, about mental disorders and psychological issues? No, we cannot. So tonight we're going to try and understand just where we are going wrong, but more and most importantly, how to make it right. Let me quickly introduce my guests and esteemed panelists that are joining us this evening. I have Dr. Sayada Rukshada, psychiatrist and psychotherapist of the Trellis Family Center in our Mumbai studio. Dr. Shambhat, psychiatrist and physician, trustee, the Live, Love, Laugh Foundation. Anand Chulani, leading su success coach, joining us. And Priyanka Gulati, the principal of the Evergreen Public School. Um, and Nelson Vinod Moses, founder of Suicide Prevention India Foundation, also joining us. Good evening to everybody. Thank you so much for joining us here. Dr. Rukshada, over to you. These numbers are concerning, especially since there has been a spike in over 20%. What are we not doing right? We're doing a lot of things that are not right. Um, uh, like you said, there's an alarming number uh, increasing number of suicides, death by suicides. Um, so I'm going to start by just correcting you here because when you say words like committed suicide, that's we are going wrong as fundamentally as that. When the, especially the press and especially the media and uh, in reports or in print or in news, when we say things like committed suicide, we're somehow blaming that person who's died of suicide. So uh, b the reason we need to start there also is because that's part of the problem, how we're looking at suicide. Are we looking at it as a public health concern? Not really. Even yet, not really. And that's increasing our issues. That's increasing because we're not doing enough suicide prevention. So if you're not looking at as it as a public health concern, we're not Great looking doctor. at it as a, a health and social concern, we're clearly not going to do a lot to prevent it. And of course, the numbers are going to go up. And the young are the most vulnerable of having any kind of psychiatric issues or mental health issues for that matter. And of course, we are going to see a spike on deaths there. So I think it's high time that we change the narrative. Okay, so, you know, Nelson, then let me understand in, in the cases that, that you deal with and do you counsel, do you feel like this alarming rate is holding, you know, a mirror to the education system in the country because, you know, that is a very big factor still? Um, it's more than just the education system. It's the social, political, economic reality. So suicide is uh, a response to things which are multifactorial. So what we hear in the news is generally what happens uh, at the very end, which is the trigger uh, that happens. But what happens behind it is, is a whole lot of other factors. So it can be related to uh, social media use. It can be related to the, the political climate. It can be related to uh, the future that they face in terms of the economic reality. It can be uh, the sudden change from moving from a smaller city to a bigger city. So. If, if, you, if, if you have one stressor or two stressors, uh, it's easier to deal with. But when you're faced with multiple stressors, all at the same time, your internal coping mechanisms, uh, whether it's, it's your intellectual, uh, biological, social uh, capabilities get diminished, and finally the response is suicide. So I want to point out that it is multifactorial and there are many... Uh, psychosocial factors um, and political factors and economic factors that play a role here. Yeah, so then, so then that's exactly what I want to ask Dr. Bhatt because while education stress is, is one of the biggest factors, you know, we're looking at IIT, we're looking at quota, which has staggering rates, there are also other issues um, that perhaps we're being dismissive about and, you know, perhaps not going into Dr. Bhatt.
No, absolutely. I think it's, you know, we, when we hear of these things, we want a simple answer. And as Nelson correctly pointed out, it's multifactorial. There's so many variables that are at play. Some of the key things to remember, though, is that there's no doubt that suicide is increasing in India and also globally. So across the world, we are seeing that teenagers and young adults are committing suicide at alarming rates now. And so clearly, there's something that has changed globally. And what are those things? Well, some of the most significant things are globalization, technology, and social media. So what we know now is that young people uh, spend far more time on social media and technology, internet, etc. And the time that they get for that, it comes out of the time that they would have otherwise spent meeting somebody face to face, going out in nature, going out to a park. So, you know, uh, today's adolescent does not have the carefree youth that uh, many, you know, in previous generations people had. And so there's a lot more stress, which results in a, in, a, in a person who has very often very high expectations of themselves and of what they want to achieve, a decreased tolerance for frustration, a sense of isolation, and often impaired lifestyle like poor sleep, not enough exercise, bad nutrition. So all of this creates a situation where there's a very high risk for depression, anxiety, meaninglessness, and suicide. And that's what we are seeing now. And you're absolutely right, Sanjana. It's something that we all should be seriously alarmed and concerned about and start making some really big changes in our society. So would you also say then, uh, Priyanka Gulati, that, that the fear of failure is something um, that needs to change when it comes to our education system? Are we laying too many expectations, unrealistic ones, on these children? Yes, ex exactly. I would agree with that because uh, when we talk about fear of failure, see, what is most important is I would rather go like to go back to the day a child is born. You know, the day a child is born, the expectation, parent's expectation, his designation is decided that he is, he'll become a doctor, engineer in Indian setup. So that is the most challenging uh, factor. Parents' pressure, which with which he's brought up and born, and uh, further, he is uh, being, uh, he, th this is inculcated in a child, you know, that he is to be this. So that freedom of a thought is curbed at the day he's born. And then the fe fe uh, fear of a failure, because he has certain set of mind where child is not trained that failures are, it's okay to fail. Because parents' expectations, societal expectations are so much from the society that uh, the child is never trained that it's okay to fail. The failure is a part and parcel of our existence. Okay, so Anand Chulani then, he's also joining us. Good evening, Anand Chulani. Thank you so much for joining us once again. He's okay. the leading success coach. Um, Anand, then, then what are these children, you know, why are they not getting... Um, the attention they deserve and they need is it is it a shortage problem because I think we've discussed that once before as well uh, Dr. Rukshida was on that panel as well where we spoke about you know perhaps the shortage of, of counselors the shortage of um, you know any kind of therapy for these children is it an access problem or then just a social cultural one I, I think it's a combination I think you definitely need more counselors for sure but even if you have the right number of counselors, you also need them to be able to pick up the right signs. I just did an event, a camp uh, at a school in Mumbai, and it was 50 kids over a day. And at the end of the day, we identified 10 kids in that class that were depressed or two, and about five were on the suicide uh, range. Two of those five were not even picked up by the counselors. So it just gives you a sense of they're great counselors in the school, but they need to know how to pick up the signs and know, because a lot of times we, we know what a child is thinking or, or what they say, but it's not what they say, it's what they say, right? It's the thought in their head and we don't have a ticker tape in their head. So it's about being able to read the signs and pick up on what I call those signals to know how to engage the child and even whether they're coming to you or not coming to you, to preempt it, to anticipate it. That's key. All right. So, um, you know, Dr. Rukshida, Maharashtra's numbers, if I can actually, you know, pull them up on our screens, um, Maharashtra's numbers are particularly disturbing because not only are we seeing uh, the number of suicides actually increase, but Maharashtra as the state also tops the list. So what could be the reason for states to have, you know, a higher rate than the others? Is it perhaps because, you know, Mumbai is in this, uh, you know, included in this state and of course, a lot of people come here attempting to fulfill their dreams. Um, you know, a lot of education here as well. If you can take us through that. 
We need to understand that, like you said, that Maharashtra is very pro-education. There's uh, higher literacy rates than a lot of other states. We do have a densely populated capital city like Mumbai, which has its own uh, stresses and that impacts physical health, mental health, and social health, and financial health. So the need to succeed is far more desperate uh, in uh, Mumbai than versus other places, definitely. But also what we need to understand is how we report it. Um, so I would like to also uh, recognize that the stigma about mental health and about even suicide is a little lesser in Maharashtra, so people are a little okay about reporting it as well, which other states may not be at par. Uh, so it's good news, bad news both. Uh, that's the reason the numbers reflect in that way. When we look at India as a whole, we understand there's one person dying of suicide every 55 seconds. That's alarming. And when we look at su student suicide rate, it's at par with farmer suicide rates. We understand that at least four students every day is killed with by suicide. Um, so it's uh, so better awareness is definitely going to increase reporting, and we would have more epidemiological data so that we can understand how to tackle the problems more. Um, as far as why Maharashtra is again leading, again multifactorial reasons, um, uh, and how do we prevent it? Is that we need to start at grassroots. We our education system not only just in Maharashtra or all, all over India, we're very employment driven. We are not really driven on basis of knowledge. There are no life skills uh, to be spoken about. We need to inculcate uh, mental health uh, in the curriculum. We need to improve the mental health literacy, not only of the students, but of the teachers, of the staff of the educational systems, and parents as well. Like he just you know, previously mentioned that there were counselors who were very good and they were even present, but they missed out a couple of children. So that's not because they might not have been adequately trained or they might not be really, really uh, good at their jobs, but also is that a, some, a, a person, any person, especially a student, will pick one person to speak to. That doesn't, doesn't mean that the other people in his or her life were not around or not there. But if that person has picked you, whether you're a parent or, or a peer or a friend or somebody uh, on, online, um, listen ask what they can do f to help and uh, that's more important you know that that normalizing of talking about it but normalizing also of asking what they can do and normalizing of wanting to help okay okay so you know we're, we're also patching uh, callers this evening our numbers are flashing on the screens please feel free to call um, if you are stressed out it is exam time if you are a parent of a child and you're also looking for tips on how to, you know, reduce the burden of your child uh, to ensure that, you know, they're not overwhelmed by the, you know, the exam season or just generally. Uh, I have a caller now joining me from the national capital, Sapna joining us from Delhi. Good evening, Sapna. Thank you so much for calling on the last word. Go ahead with your question, please. Good evening, dear. My question, um, uh, my grade is, my son is in grade four right mm -hmm. now. And like, uh, seven to eight chapters coming in test for him is a lot, you know, it's a pressure. You know, just now a lady principal, with all respects, she just said, it's the pressure from the parents. Why don't you agree? There's a hundred, there's a 70 percent pressure from the teachers also, from the principals also. Why they are giving seven to eight chapters to, to a kid, that to a fourth grade kid? I mean, like, I mean, like, practically, you can go in any school. They are doing so. My son is international. Still he finds, you know, he goes, Mom, my head is blasting. How much more I have to study? He goes in a group tuition, and there are kids coming from all good schools. Or actually, uh, quote, in quote, all schools are good. You know, but so much pressure is there. Tutors are teaching, the honest tutors are teaching them, like, at home also, at tutor, tuition time also. Why? Because they have to mug up. They have to understand. They want good grades. Otherwise, you know, I know a kid of a prep class. I don't want to name a school. The teacher is calling a mother. He cannot write A properly. He is not paying attention. Please, for God's sake, why so much pressure on the kids? Why, why public school wants so many, so much good numbers to just to just to make their reputation? This is a lot. You know, my son says, "Mama, take me back to the Canada." He is in grade four. Okay. I don't have a pressure over there till grade eight. 
tell me where do the kids stand so you know this this is something that uh, that perhaps i think i've been hearing since i was in school uh, priyanka gulati what are the immediate steps one can take because would an overhaul of the education system be too big uh, an ask at this point of time uh as far as i understand first thing uh, madam just now said that the child has to score good grades you know when i talk about good grades what exactly good grades are is a plus a criteria i have seen a students so the child who is scoring a plus throughout the life has had a mediocre professional life whereas a child who is mediocre as a, a, a child has excelled in his life so the criteria which we are thinking a plus grades are not important understanding the curriculum the understanding of the text is what is important first aspect is this we have to understand as a teacher we have to understand as a parent and we have to understand as a society that when we talk about grades please a plus is not the criteria my student who failed in class 11th got a national award from dr abdul kalam azad in his app for developing a mobile application national award he was a failure in 11th standard and he is a ceo ceo of a one of the leading company and getting offers all around the world so do we have that kind of we as a parent as a teacher as a uh, school as a society once again i will say that it is very important for us to understand grade is not the criteria please that is very the pressure child has to see curriculums are like that our students uh, curriculums are like that and it is around the world i would around the globe right i would not say it is just in india it is around the globe the pressure the kind of a pressure could be differ, different but then a child have to sub, uh, submit an uh, su assessments a child has to regularly submit to a lot of uh, uh, even in international schools they have to submit their assessments regularly so the pressure is there it's okay but that are we teaching our child to take up challenges in life okay are we making them strong enough that they are ready to take any kind of a challenges okay so to all me right. that is what is important all right so so dr sham bhat if i would ask you you know to offer uh you know advice or any kind of tips to sapna who's you know who's talking about her son and how he's feeling overwhelmed uh would it also be of the same opinion that you know perhaps the child needs to feel that you know education prowess or success is not you know the be all and end all there are other ways to you know perhaps achieve success no absolutely i think it's really important for all our children not to be shamed you know what i'm hearing is a lot of shaming and actually in our society often we use shame as a way of parenting as a way of teaching people as a way of getting our kids to do what they're supposed or what we think they're supposed to do and that for many especially uh, vulnerable people can leave behind uh, you know can harm their self esteem and cause a lot of stress and anxiety I just want to make a couple of points though. Firstly, you know, I think parents have put pressure on their children all the time. I think, you know, this is not the first generation where parents have put pressure on their children. They have done that in the past as well. In fact, one could argue that today's generation has more opportunity than just medicine or engineering, which was the case some decades ago. Also keep in mind that countries like Canada and the United States where we're not seeing this kind of parental pressure are seeing an explosion of suicide rates in their youngest population. So what I'm saying is that uh, because of the various factors I talked about, and of course pressure is one of them but keep in mind that a lot of the expectations today are also internal a uh, children and adolescents are exposed to social media uh, media itself you know sort of glorifies young success you know you've got to be a celebrity famous and rich at a young age and this creates an enormous sense of uh, pressure within people and they feel that their lives are completely useless unless they achieve really high you know standards and so this internal expectation is also very key we must keep that in mind and so what is key is building emotional intelligence how do you deal with your feelings how do you deal with sadness how do you deal with frustration how do you stay persistent how do you stay optimistic how do you recognize depression and what do you do when you're depressed or someone close to you is depressed so at the live love love foundation we've actually been doing a program for the last couple of years called you are not alone and we've reached out to 150000 school children more than uh, 20000 teachers in 700 uh, schools in about nine states in the country i know it's a small number but we are already seeing that when we do that when we start uh, approaching teachers parents and students making everybody aware then that's a very good first step so what i would say is if you're stressed 
and you, you know, you're finding it very hard to cope, then seek a professional help. Talk to a counselor. Parents should be absolutely take it seriously if their child ever says, I want to die, I want, don't want to live, I'm feeling very stressed out. Mm -hmm. Parents should take that seriously and get their children professional help. And you know what, I hope that we, we can have a more balanced society where education is just one of those things and we reward our, you know, children and all of us for being good human beings and, and people who can take care of our feelings. I think that's really, really important. Right. You know, I, I'm actually, I actually want to now you know, discuss about you know, perhaps the way parents should be dealing with children. But before that, let me quickly take in another caller. I have Roshan Lal joining us from Kurukshetra this evening. Good evening. Thank you so much for calling in on The Last Word. Go ahead. Good evening, madam. Good evening, sir. Go ahead. And I just request you to just turn the volume of your television set down, please. Yes, yes, madam. I just want to express my views that nowadays parents have too high expectations from... Yes, I have turned it down. And uh, I just want to make it because of the undue expectation of the parents from their children without assessing their aptitude, without knowing about their real abilities. They just keep spending money on coaching and other things. Then they have two high expectations. And ultimately, when they are not able to have that, that high academic attainment, so those students feel so much stress, so much press, that they are forced to commit a suicide in order to... Well, when they are not able to come up with the expectation of their parents, mm -hmm. they are forced to commit suicide. And this kind of expectation nowadays has grown so much that it needs to be monitored and needs to be reduced because unless and until realistic expectations are made, things are going from bad to worse. Well, okay. We should, must know what uh, uh, natural abilities our uh, our children have mm -hmm. and uh, on that basis we should proceed all right only by spending money on our children we cannot raise them to great heights absolutely absolutely mr roshan lal uh, pertinent point point raised there anand chulani uh, you know just like you're working with with groups of children uh, the youth do you think that it is equally important to you know turn attention to parents have counseling sessions as well for them Absolutely. Uh, before I jump into that, I want to just add one more piece. People are talking about parents' expectations, teachers' expectations. But one thing we're not talking about today, which is a very big, important factor for millennials, which is kids' expectations of themselves. So many times I've seen actually the parents or the teachers have decent expectations for the child, but they themselves have pressure. At the same, same school I spoke at, there's a child in that, in that class that everyone called the walking encyclopedia. He's the smartest kid. In fact, he teaches. Uh, teachers and when at the end of the session he wrote down his limiting belief about himself and he wrote down on his paper I am stupid I am useless and this is the smartest kid in the entire classroom so the expectations kids have them themselves is very important I think it's a threefold approach it's it's students it's teachers and it's parents if you just walk on one wing it's not possible you need to hold up the whole chair and I think you need to look at all different legs of it it's those three things that are critically important and they have to be speaking the same language and to have to have the same tools. And I would add a fourth category to this, which is peers. I believe the power of peers is so important for kids that they need, it's their support group, it's their own friends. So if they have those four legs, I think they're really supported. And what was amazing about this session was once I think the kid in that class we turned around, now every kid in there had a, had a literally we gave them a way to identify suicide in a, in a fellow friend of yours mm -hmm. so they put the signs themselves and can do it. And we're all speaking that same language as power. And I, all I would lastly to say is if there's a child out there right now and you're worried, if there's a parent out there and worried, let me tell you, suicide is not something in a book. It's something in you. I've been suicidal in my life when I was 13. I've worked with over 150 people who are suicide kids. And let me tell you something, the, the number one thing you want to turn it around is one factor. Create a reason to live. Create a vision that will pull you forward. Find a reason. It could be your brother and sister. It could be seeing your parents thing. It could be a dream you have. Find a compelling reason, a future that deserves you to stay on this earth. Okay. Okay, let me, uh, you know, uh, 
Very, very pertinent advice there. Let me also quickly bring in another caller. We have Surya Narayan joining us from Chennai. Good evening. Thank you so much for joining us on uh, Mirror Now. Go ahead. See, your topic is uh, very relevant nowadays uh, on the present situation. See, um, thousands of schools in India, but not even one psychiatrist in thousand schools. See, now it is an order of the day. Every school should have, every school who is having a more than 500 students should have a psychiatrist. Two, the parents refuse to take the children to their professional psychiatrist. Mm. They feel it is, they will be isolated in the um, community. Third one, the system of education is to make memorize more rather than to take the points. Fourth one, the system of having a uh, pranayama, yoga, every day in the schools is all of the day. He said, you are pinpointing 10,000 students to say, but millions of students got stressed and the productivity has come down. That was not taken into consideration. I think you understand, because the real potential of the students have not come out because of the stress. Only 10,000 students got suicide was highlighted, but millions of students were not able to expose that potential because of the moral lack of moral education. Both parents are going for a job, little taking care of, and more the parents too much dependence on social media like Facebook, WhatsApp, and so many reasons. But the government should make every institution should have a psychiatrist and a moral education should be compulsory in the schools at least every three days once. All and right. 20 years back. Yes? Okay. Surya Narayanan, thank you so much uh, for calling in from Chennai. Uh, you know, uh, Nelson, because we're seeing, we're very quick to dismiss, you know, social media. And um, obviously, I think, uh, you know, it, it, the parents perhaps at every age I, I often hear my parents tell me that okay you know that the reason I have a headache is probably because I'm scrolling on my phone too much or I have you know social media on because and that seems to be you know uh, a, a convenient way to you know say that okay this is the reason for everything but I also feel that it, you know we're very quick to dismiss social media but I think that we don't also understand the power of it and how actually that, that can, you know, be used as a tool to help these children. Because, I mean, look at TikTok, for example. They've, they've signed up with, with Save the Children. They're putting out excellent content on, you know, beating the stress, um, you know, education tips, uh, what to do before your exams. So perhaps do you think that we need to, you know, understand how to use social media, you know, coach our children, our parents and our teachers and, you know, educational institutions accordingly? Yeah, that's... That's a great point. Uh, so before I come to how social media can help, uh, I just want to go back to what Dr. Sham pointed out about uh, social media and technology. So in the U.S., uh, uh, between 2010 and 2015, uh, depression among U.S. teens increased by 33 uh, percent. Suicide attempts increased by 23 percent. And the number of suicides increased by 31 percent. And this coincided with smartphone usage. So by 2012, smartphone usage had uh, jumped across 50%. And by 2015, it had reached almost 73% of all teens. Now, to the question about saying, uh, so there is clearly a link between increase in the use of uh, social media, smartphone apps, and saying, uh, you know, use, the usage of it. Now, coming to your point about saying, is it all evil? So... A lot of young people, what happens is because uh, they are digitally connected but uh, socially isolated, uh, will seek help digitally. Now, if they open up, uh, you know, Tumblr or Snapchat or Instagram or Facebook, and they're looking for something related to self-harm or suicide, and they actually find stories and information that tells them how to deal with it, uh, social media is hugely helpful. Also, what we have to realize is, uh, but on the other hand, if they actually find that social media is promoting such behavior as it was earlier, and, and I think both Instagram, um, at, at, uh, at Tumblr, Snapchat, everybody is now woken up to the fact, and of course, uh, TikTok, who we had a tie-up with for World Suicide, uh, Suicide Prevention Day, um, 
is looking at creating ways to increase help-seeking behavior. That's what is needed. So you have to increase ways where you have reduced the shame and the stigma of seeking help. And you have role models who are coming up and saying, this is fine to seek help. It is fine to be not okay and to be okay with not being okay and being able to express those feelings and emotions. So yes, social media can be a tool where you can go and seek help, realize you are not alone because a person who's feeling emotionally distressed or suicidal is feeling helpless, hopeless, and worthless. And mostly they're thinking that they are the only people going through this. So the sense of loneliness that I'm the only person going through it can be negated on social media because you feel a sense of connectedness to others. Suppose you're going through uh, an issue related to sexuality right. or, uh, or gender or a body image or, you know, uh, re related to an eating disorder. Mm -hmm. or, 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 or you, you learn a lot more or something where, you know, which there is not a lot of information about. Like, let's say, premenstrual dysphoric disorder, a situation where young women increasingly face when they, uh, you know, when they're menstruating, they have low moods. And this is not just, uh, you know, facing the blues right. during this yes, time, but it's being a lot more actively serious, suicidal. Yes. So, yes, social media as a tool um, can be used with places like Reddit and other forums. You can seek help and feel connected to a community who is helpful to you. So it is, an, uh, and that should be taught in schools and colleges where you, you are able to use this as a tool to benefit you. And, you know, reach out to peers in a community who, who are supportive, who do not shame you and reduce the stigma of seeking help. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that, that's a good point there. Let me also quickly bring in another caller now. This time joining us from Unnao is Naveen. Good evening. Thank you so much, Naveen. I believe that you underwent uh, a lot of stress recently. You were giving an exam. Uh, I'm very sorry to hear that. I hope you're feeling better right now. Uh, would you like to share your experience with us? Yes, ma'am. Of course. Ma'am, when I was preparing for my JMN exam, a letter before, mm -hmm. ma'am, after my result, I feel a little bit depressed. And I want to ask for many viewers who are also faced this situation. Not I am only. In, the, in India, there are many students who are facing this thing. So um, I want to ask that how to get rid of this depression sort of things to move ahead in your life and feel positive. Okay. Dr. Rukshada, would you like to take that? Um, at the outset, thank you very much for sharing your story with us and I hope you feel better soon. What you can do is if you think that you have sadness of mood or changes in sleep patterns or changes in eating patterns or behavior and if that has lasted for more than 15 days, you must seek professional help. The professional help could be from a friendly family physician, it could be a psychologist that you might know of or a psychiatrist who is a specialist in this field. Um, what you could also do is ask help from other peers as well, like in Mumbai at least, and uh, we have something called YAMI, which is a support group for young adults with mental illnesses. Uh, and we do use social media to promote the support group in that sense, and that's how a lot of young people come to attend the support group because they get to know about it from social media. So there may be support groups in and around you, or you could reach out to somebody. There are sometimes even support groups that might be available online. You could There are online counseling uh, uh, facilities that you could take help of. Every government hospital and more, a lot of you know public hospitals and private and public health centers do have a psychiatrist or a psychiatric OPD there. If you do require medications, you should take medications for depression or anxiety. If you, at, at, at an urgent level, if you feel that while you're sitting alone and you start getting a suicidal thought or a feeling of dispendency, sit with someone else. Don't sit alone. Uh, you could call up somebody, just chat. You don't necessarily have to share exactly what you're feeling if, you do, if you're not comfortable, if you don't want to. But if you sit with someone that at least kind of prevents you and helps you, puts up that extra speed barrier in, in that you might not act on your suicidal thought. So self-preservation, self-care at that point is imperative. And as soon as possible, you need to, you should take professional help. Um, there are a lot of psychiatrists and psychologists who are very active on social media. So even if you get in touch with them via whichever means, whether DM them or inbox them, and they can at least help you find a reference in and around you that might be easily available and 
accessible to you. Uh, yes, uh, commercials can be a barrier. You might not be able to afford a lot of com private health care, but there are different levels of health care. Like I, every psychiatrist I know and every, a lot of psychologists I know also give their work for affordable care. So you might want to see resource and source out these places. Um, these places do exist. We might just not know where they are. So ask anybody to get in, to get yourself there. Um, speak to somebody that you think you can connect with because that emotional connection, that uh, social connection, that human connection really makes a lot of difference. Go hug someone because that really makes a lot of difference. Ask somebody to hug you because that increases your oxytocin levels and your serotonin levels. It makes you feel better. Uh, simple things, uh, start exercising, sleep better, remove junk from your food. A lot of simple lifestyle changes can also help you improve your mood and definitely prevent you from acting on that suicidal idea if you have that. We need to understand that there is a genetic vulnerability some people might have that you might predispose you for suicidality. And especially if you know of somebody in your family or you know immediate family or second degree family that has a psychiatric illness, please do not hesitate. Get yourself screened, get yourself treated as soon as possible. Okay, wonderful advice and completely agree there. Uh, Anand, I believe you also have some advice for Naveen. Go ahead. Yes, Naveen, let me ask you a question. What score did you get on that test? Is Naveen there? Naveen, are you still with us on the phone line? Yes, ma'am. Yes. There. Go ahead. Would you, are you comfortable score? answering what, what score you got on that exam? Ma'am, 81 percentile. 81%. 81%. Yes, so I was just 8% percentile below the par score of general category. Got it. My question to you is this. Is, yes, um, does 81% represent who you are? I scored 42% on all my tests from 15 to 18 years old. And I think I'm doing okay today. Yes, sir. I, I, I don't think 81%. I, I'm getting you. I'm getting you. So what are you trying to say? is not a reflection of who you are, my friend. That's just a reflection of what you scored on one test in your life. You have many more tests in life, many more reasons to, many more ch reasons to, to improve that score. Your score is not a reflection of who you are. Who you are is already someone who's a champion and nothing can take that away. So I'm just telling you right now, 81%, if you learn, can you do well in your next test? Yes, sir. I can improve myself in the next test. Got it. So then there's, so if you can improve, then you can grow. And what if success from now on is not about what score you get in a test, but whether you can learn and whether you can grow? What if that's the definition of success? Yes, sir. Naveen, I, I, I hope you take this advice and, and I hope you, you feel better. Thank you so much for calling in. We really appreciate it. And don't worry, those are just scores. Uh, let, let me just uh, quickly now, uh, you know, just just uh, shift the discussion back to, you know, the statistics and the figures that, uh, you know, the NCRB data has actually thrown up. Uh, you know, because Dr. Sham, we're also seeing uh, with regards to West Bengal, just like we spoke about Maharashtra and how, you know, the numbers have only increased in West Bengal. Back in 2016, the numbers were really high. We're talking in thousands. But as the years have progressed, the numbers seem to have dipped. So would this, um, you know, be an implication that perhaps people aren't reporting as much or, you know, would it mean that the state has actually taken some steps to ensure that um, the youth are happier, they're in a better place, that, you know, that we're not dealing with such staggering numbers of uh, student suicides? I'm not sure we can infer anything from that. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know the specifics, obviously, of what, what has happened in, in West Bengal, but um, I'm not sure you can infer much from that. I think you have to be aware that, you know, the reporting of suicide in India is probably, it's, we still, they're still under-reporting of a lot of suicide. So I think, I, tragically, the numbers we're hearing uh, is probably an underestimation of what is happening. We have to take a longer-term perspective about this. You know, uh, a few months ago, an article came out in The Lancet, and it... Uh, it had this very startling uh, statistic, which is that the leading cause of death today in Indians between the ages of 15 and 39 is suicide. I just want that to sink in a bit. You know, this, this is a national 
problem of epidemic proportions. And we're not going to have an easy answer tonight because there are no easy answers, but we know what to do. We just need, uh, I think, uh, government and everybody else to join in. We know what to do. We, as, as many of us have said tonight, we need to educate children in emotional intelligence starting as very much part of their curriculum. We need to get parents aware on how to deal with their children in today's world where parents are both working, both stressed out, they don't have much time for their kids. What do you do? Uh, we should know, and this is really important, we should know when to differentiate from someone who is going through a low mood because of dejection and disappointment, which we all experience at times, to something like depression. And, you know, I think motivation, for example, uh, is, is important, but we should not mistakenly think that we can motivate a person out of depression by just cheering them up and telling them to think positively. That's not mm. going to work. And too many people have died in our country because we have done that instead of actually getting professional help, you know. And, and the problem with professional help uh, is that we just don't have enough psychiatrists today. We have 4,000 to 5,000 psychiatrists, maybe 6,000, in this country of 1.2 billion people. So we just don't have enough psychiatrists. And one of the things we need to do is get all doctors, every medical doctor has to understand psychiatry today. When I went to medical school, nobody wanted to study psychiatry. Today, I think nobody has a choice. Every doctor, especially if you're a general physician, a family physician, you have to uh, be adept at psychiatry enough to diagnose, treat, simple conditions, when I say simple, I mean from the sense of they're much more common and they're easier to treat, like depression and anxiety. So again, at the foundation, we are training GPs as part of an initiative to get more professionals in this. So this is going to need all of that and more in order to avert uh, this epidemic. So whatever the statistics in Bengal, I can say I don't think such systemic changes have yet happened, but I think conversations like this hopefully will propel you know, policymakers and everybody to start taking these actions because all our young people are at risk today and that's something that should concern all of us. Absolutely. So, you know, I, I'm going to get another caller, but before that, um, Anand, do you feel that perhaps also uh, a big factor is, is that children are not taken seriously in India? We tend to infantilize our own children even when they are grown up. Uh, but at the same time, we have, you know, these unrealistic expectations from them. So they're never really looked at as equals or adults with real world problems. I agree. You know, it's funny. The so many times I meet parents and they tell me, you know, when you talk to your child, talk to children about emotional resilience, they won't understand it. They won't understand it. But I've seen situations where I've seen adults, parents, give a standing ovation to children with the level of insight that they can create. I think we tend to look at our children and kind of look at them in a way. I mean, we look at the world, and a Greta Thunberg today can stand up and speak to global leaders but we still look at our and diminish the view by what our children and what their potential is. I think we have to look at them as the leaders of their own lives. And then I think that's the first thing. And leaders of their own lives doesn't mean they have all the answers. Our job is to support them. Our, our job is to give them the tools, the resources. I, but I think the key part is this, is to really help them understand that taking care of their own emotional health is their responsibility and it will be their responsibility for life. I think our goal is not just to help them from age one to 18, mm. but really to set them up to win beyond that. And yes, we can get them tools, we can get them resources, we can get them coaches, psychiatrists, and all those things. But ultimately, they have to be honest about how they're feeling, and they have to learn some tools to support themselves and, and be, a, be a participant in their own rescue. Absolutely, and not be, not be ashamed of it. I, I have another caller on the line. I have Sabri Karthik joining me. Uh, from Tamil Nadu. Good evening. Thank you so much for calling in, Sabri. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, thanks for Last World uh, for bringing up this most important topic and discussing on it. And uh, I was into uh, karate, Indian karate team. Uh, and uh, right now, I run two organizations, okay. Face Sports and uh, Right to Sport Foundation. Okay. And uh, under Face, uh, uh, we focus on physical health and sports education for children. And we are reaching out to totally 5,000 number of students across various places. And uh, I just want to share a very interesting uh, observation sure. uh, on this. So we uh, tend to see, we believe that children will become stress-free and they will get emotionally healthy when they play on ground. But even there, we found uh, we are motivating children to even compete and get medals for, uh, on, while playing. Mm. 
So okay. even there, they tend to get stressed, and it is not helping mm-hmm. them anymore. So what we feel is that we focused on uh, making children happy and healthy. So happy children and healthy lifestyle is most important thing now. So that's what we focused on. So one most important observation which we did, we did a survey in one of the schools in North India, uh, and uh, after conducting this program for a year. So we found 99 percentage of the children found this kind of activity to be joyful. Okay. And 89 percentage of them found it is uh, helping them to stay emotionally healthy wow. and stay out of stress. Okay. But the sad part is that when we took this to the management, they are feeling this. Uh, they are not valuing this so much as the results uh, uh, of winning medals or so much. So what we found is that uh, these kind of activities should be given more uh, importance. Absolutely. Even in the school, even in the school and out of school, and children, uh, the parents should play with children uh, more. The, and nowadays it is getting, I mean, it is uh, coming less and less every day. And uh, even when the child comes from a school or from a playground, mm-hmm. the, the parents should ask them, "Did you enjoy playing?" Rather than did you score today or what is your score? Absolutely. So, we seem to have lost the line there with Sabri Karthik, but uh, wonderful work that he's doing there. I quickly need to take in another caller. We're, we're running out of time now. <clears throat> Colonel Atul joining us from Guru Gram. Good evening, sir. Thank you so much for joining us on Mirror. Now go ahead. Yeah. Hi. Uh, good evening to you. Good evening. Firstly, I must complete in this. Right. Please. We seem to have a problem with the connection there as well. Uh, sir, I would request you to please try and call in again. We'll, we'll try and patch you in in just a, just a minute. Uh, you know, Priyanka, just, go, just going forth from what uh, our last scholar actually spoke about with regards to, you know, um, school management, you know, being a little hesitant when it comes to introducing this kind of curriculum or introducing making this kind of thing mandatory so that children feel happy and healthy. Uh, that, and do you feel like the government also needs to perhaps fix the condition of primary education with regard to infrastructure and the number of teachers to actually solve these problems so that you're able to give attention and notice these kinds of behavior patterns in children? Uh, right. As far as uh, school management being hesitant, I would rather say that uh, these days school managements are rather open because this, this is a challenge which every school management is facing these days. Secondly, as far as government, CBSC has made mandatory one physical education period every day in school curriculum. Okay. So as far as physical education is concerned, that goes right uh, compulsory part of a curriculum and two uh, periods in a week for dance and art and craft. So that means that child is giving, g- getting a sufficient access to release his uh, whatever issues he has, what uh, Sabri just now said. Now, another thing, school has, most of the school in Delhi NCR, at least I can talk about, has a school counselor. Like in my school, school counselor makes it a point that she goes to playground during lunch period and interact with students, observe them standing in the corner. During this personal time, she stands and observe them in the corner and catch them right there and then when she sees that the child has a problem. So counselor is already there in every school and they're playing a very, very vital role these days. So uh, I think uh, CBSC, if we talk about CBSC, CBSC Mm -hmm. these days during examination has online going program 24-7 where child who is under depression goes back to CBSC, can call any time a day. And I think this facility most of the school counselors are giving in the schools also this time. All right. So, you know, Colonel Atul is back with us on the phone line. We seem to have lost the line there earlier. Uh, Good evening, sir. Thank you so much for joining us on Mirror Now. Go ahead. Yeah, hi, good evening. So basically, after being in the army for some time and then I joined the corporate world, recently I opened a very nice small startup. It's called The Art of Working. The Art of Working basically focuses on the kind of stress all the young children, millennials, post millennial uh, generation is currently facing. What I have realized over a period of time is that the entire society, schools, educational institutes, are to be blamed to some extent for the stress which we have developed. 
from grade one, we focus on just two to five percent people who are successful in their classes. We leave the masses, that is 95 percent of children are not considered to be successful. So that mindset needs to be changed. Is the 95 percent people or children in a class or institute needs to be made successful or made to feel successful? Secondly, I've seen, and while I recruited people in a multinational company, I have found children who have not done very well in education turn out to be an excellent worker. They have the resilience, they have the kindness, they have the engagement in this, and they want to prove a point. So I would like to tell the children who are watching this program, in fact, even if you don't do well in your education, you would still certainly do very well in your employment. So don't lose heart. Three basic principles which I have learned is communication. You need to communicate with people. The teachers, the parents, and the children need to communicate. Right. And communication is both ways. Right. Need to connect with each other from heart. Understand. And right from the school, create communities. Don't create competition. Create communities. Right. That 50 right. children in a class can create a community for each other to hold hands. Don't make one guy run faster than the rest. Take everyone along. That community is going to ensure all your life to hold each other's hand and be successful together. So that mindset needs to be changed totally as a society if we need to. All right. Further. Colonel Atul, I'm, I'm sorry, so sorry to cut you off there. Colonel Atul uh, sharing, again, wonderful work that he's done from Gurugram. Unfortunately, we're completely out of time. But thank you so much to my panelists for joining us this evening and to really understand uh, this grim problem that, you know, that we're facing. Uh, hopefully, this also means that there's more reporting, that there's more awareness, there's more understanding and more ways to tackle the issue of student suicides because it's slowly becoming India's education epidemic. Thank you so much for watching The Last Word. Good night.